My story is a very simple one about a Dublin working man called Matt Talbot. Matt came from a very, very poor family of four brothers and three sisters. And his father and brothers worked down on the docks. And all of them were drunkards. They would spend all their money on drink. Matt left school at the age of 12. And today, in the school book, you can see Matt Talbot Mitcher, because he was never at school. When he left school at 12, he got a job in a wine bonders down in Seville Place. And of course, helped himself to whatever was going. After a while, he was rumbled and he was sacked. He then got a job down in T&C Martins, which were timber merchants, and he would help to unload all the ships. He was a terrific worker and he was called the pace setter. He would be put to the front so as the men behind would keep up with him. But Matt himself, every halfpenny he earned, went on drink. And his mother used to be in a terrible state about him. He'd come home and he'd hand her a shilling at the weekend. He'd say, Mother, is that any use? And she'd say, God forgive you, Matt. Is that all you're going to give me? And even for those times, a shilling was very little. To try and keep the family going, she took in washing. And Matt then eventually got really into the drink, so much so that he sold his boots one time for drink. Another story is that there was a fiddler playing outside of a pub one day and he stole the fiddle and he sold that too for a drink. Now this went on for some years and one of his brothers died of alcoholism. Matt continued on as he was until one time he was out of work, work was slack. And by the way, Matt was a member of this, wasn't SIP2 then, it was a Transport and General Workers Union and he was out of work. And as he always did, he'd go down to the pub on the North Strand and he'd have a drink. When his workmates had no money, he would invite them in. But this particular day, he'd no money. And down he went and stood outside the pub, hoping that they would call him to go in. But they all passed him by. And he was so hurt, he went home and told his mother, Mother, I'm taking the pledge. And she said, Matt, don't take it. I'll let you mean it. So he went up to Clonliffe College and he took the pledge for six months. But he still was terribly tempted to drink. So to try and keep away from pubs, he would attend mass in various churches around Dublin. Still worked, he still worked at this time in TNC Martins. But there was one particular story which I think it has to be divine intervention. He decided, now I'm not going to drink anymore. And he was on his way to Gardner Street to Mass when the need overcame. He needed the drink. It was so bad. So he went into a pub on the corner there at Dorset Street. And as he walked up to the, the bar, the barman just kept passing up and down as though he didn't see him. And it was like as if there was divine intervention there. This was to happen. So he finally collected himself walked out, and from that day onward, never, ever took money in his pocket. He began then to realise how bad a life he had led and decided he was going to do something about it. So he worked, and until the strike came in 1913, he was in work. When the strike came, the lockout, the big lockout, he was so humble a man, he didn't come back to the union to get his money, as they, they did get in those days, the union dues. He didn't do that. But people came and got it for him. But that money was spent on the poor people all around him. He never kept very much for himself. He lived on a mixture of tea and cocoa. Now, can you imagine what that was like? Hard bread and margarine, and that was his daily intake. He continued on then with his prayers and his mother and, and himself went to live in 18 Upper Rutland Street and she would see him at night time for hours on his knees at the side of the bed praying. He tried to make reparation for the fiddle that he'd stole and he searched Dublin but couldn't find him. So the only thing he could do then was have a mass said for him because he realised by now he must be dead. 
He was an old man. He became, a, a, you would call, a possibly a monk in his own little room. He kept to himself, and people in the house around him could hear he had a beautiful voice, and he wasn't one of these holy, holy, holy men. He was in one way, but in another he was a happy man, and people would hear him uh, singing hymns. He was a very, very good and kindly man. However, this went on until 19... He was born in, in 1856, and he died in 1925. And he was on his way to Mass one Sunday morning, Holy Trinity Sunday, into a church in Downing Street. And as he turned into Granby Row, he stumbled and fell. And the people rushed to him. But by that time, he was gone. He was taken to Jervis Street Hospital. And as the, the nuns were preparing his body for burial, they discovered that he had chains tied around his leg. Now, they weren't embedded, they were loose, but great discomfort. And he did that as a penance for the life he had led and made up in every way he possibly could. He was taken to Jervis Street and it took two days before his sisters found out where he had gone. So shortly after his death and burial, the word began to go around. This was a very, very holy man and a very, very good man. It came to the ears of the Archbishop, and the Archbishop collected everything he could find about him and sent everything off to Rome. Matt is now servant of God, and what they're waiting for is a miracle now. One miracle will suffice if people pray hard enough for it. And his tomb is a beautiful Wicklow granite tomb in the Church of Our Lady of Lourdes. And anybody that wants to can go and visit that. His bed is there. And by the way, he used to sleep with a piece of wood as a mattress and a piece of wood for his head, all to mortify himself. So you're all very, very welcome to come visit there whenever you feel like it. Thank you very much. <laughs>